I was hoping it would be 7.18 by the time I start inside joke. But anyway, welcome back. This is still TV3 New Day. It's time now for the big issue. And my guest is here, Hajia Amafrimpon. She speaks for the MPP. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How about you? I'm okay. Have you had a good week? Because um, you have such a broad smile. I'm always I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not always. Not but, always. Um, so far, so good. Yes, I had some, I, I did some good... Um, Deed, so I've been excited. Mm, I see. Good for you. But how are the preparations towards this weekend's elections looking? Um, I am not really involved, in, involved oh. in it, but I, I've seen the euphoria, the excitement, mm. the planning that goes into it. I've, I've been part of it before, so mm. I know. And I'm, I've driven past the um, Stadium okay. a few times this mm. weekend. I've seen the the grounds team have already started, started working. working and ensuring that everything goes well. So um, I know your team will be there. Probably yes, start from cover. Friday. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. Uh, up till maybe Sunday morning. Normally runs into the mm. morning. So but Saturday is the D day. Um, I wish all the aspirants um, the, best. the best of luck. I would have thought that you'd have postponed it as a party, by the way. And this is a concern that was also shared by the executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. He says that looking at the dire situation we find ourselves in economically, uh, it would have made some sense. And of course, the level of labor unrest in the country to just postpone the National Congress, at least for now, so we can focus more on addressing those issues. Because we know when it comes to elections that people who probably may be displaying, um, you know, um, and finding ways to get people to vote for them. And all of that may not, you know, um, register well with especially the labor unions who are at the moment agitated. So it would have been right um, if we um, Good morning, Ghana. Um, good morning to your beautiful self. Uh, I appreciate their concerns. But at the moment, I think every Ghanaian, irrespective of being part of the NPP or NDC, CPP, knows the situation we are in now. Mm. And... It would be very, for lack of a better word, um, unwise for any aspirant or any person coming to the conference to come and stand there and display opulence mm. for, for, you know, to show off or to um, give something out, you know, display that. Mm. For starters, there's um, not much money in the system. Yeah. So that's one thing. Then secondly, we are, in a, we are in a situation, like you said, where there's a, a bit of some labor unrest, and mm. then you stand there, and then that will make you one insensitive to tone deaf to the, the current happenings around. Mm. Um, the organizers, the planning committee, I know they've had a series of meetings with every aspirant, and they've told them, or they already know what situation we are in now mm. as a country. So it would be, be very unwise of course, there will be the normal excitement, jama, you know, you know that goes on with um, a conference or any gathering. Mm. It be it, you know, when you go there, you see people clad in their local, you know, you see the drums flowing mm. here and there, somebody coming in and then people shouting honorable and all yeah. that. That would be there. That generates a little bit of excitement. But then it's not going to be where you see someone and because they start screaming at you, you, you roll down your car window or you pull out your wallet and then start exactly. throwing you're sure that that's not going I, to happen i i know that's not going it to happen. happen so I, if for example professor ross for example posted on facebook and he said part of what would moderate or fuel the stance of all demanding cola I, i've seen and it better that salaries in this period of hardship would be the monies that will be changing hands from now up to the end of saturday in the ruling party's national leadership elections um professor jumpo is is uh, he's made a post and he he thinks money will change hands People are going to vote for those they want to lead us into the next elections and the next four years. If someone is coming, there are people traveling from um, Tamale, all, all across Ghana, the diaspora and all of that. They've all um, arrived in the country mm. for the elections. Some um, The ones in Ghana are going to start traveling from maybe Friday afternoon. Yeah. The, the party has an organizational committee. They've arranged transport for them. They've arranged accommodation for them. You know, mm. they would eat because you can't expect someone to come in from Friday up till um, Saturday and not have something to eat. Mm. So they will be having food there. Apart from what's going to be given to them, people are coming to sell. It's also a day where there's a lot of market activities. You have the fan eye seller. You have 
people selling party mm. paraphernalia. So it will happen anyway. So there will be money changing hands, not because someone is going to entice a delegate. Okay. But if I come out and someone is standing there and they say to me, Haja, please buy me a bottle mm. of water. And I take money and I, I buy a bottle of water for someone. It doesn't mean that I've gone to stand there and I'm okay. enticing someone. So whatever happens, there will be changing of money. There will be money there. If, if I stood out there and 20 people came out and I'm buying ice cream and mm. they all like, you know, buy me a fun yogo and I buy some for but them. But you know, that, that's not what they're referring to. I know to, what, but, anyway, but I'm just saying that you don't expect on. people to come and stand out there or go to where someone is staying because like it or not, these days with the advent of social media, live feeds, mm -hmm. um, journalists, delegates, even the people around, you have uh, people's yeah, phones, exactly. you know, on what you call on auto. Mm -hmm. The moment they see someone coming in, they are videoing you and all that. So you, you're definitely going to have things that are not part of the main um, conference, but happen outside, coming on to social media and okay. all that. So with that advent, I'm sure every person that's standing or going into the elections is going mm. to be careful, knows all the right. situation we are in. But since you've brought that up, I'd like to, um, I wish all the aspirants, but I have a few favorites, so please pardon me. For you, you cannot campaign. I'm not campaigning. I, I'm I not campaigning. Allow, I just wish I cannot allow that, uh, the national the youth organizer <laughs> aspirants, especially Salam. That's the venue, uh, by the way, on the screens. Um, this uh, is the Accra Sports Stadium. That is where the elections will be held. And I can see already, like you mentioned, that some work has already started. Because it's a lot of work. Prepping, yes, yes, the grounds for the elections. So, so we wish all the aspirants the best. Um, yeah. Don't, don't do uh, Salam, <laughs> Nana B, and then my big sister, KJ, who I wish them the best. I see. All right. Well, anyway, let's see how that goes. And of course, right here on TV3, we'll keep you apprised. So this is where you ought to watch from Friday through till Saturday. Uh, so you can get all the information on who won chairman, national organizer, and of course, the other positions that are up for grabs as well during the national Congress. But uh, shortly, we'll have lawyer Joyce Bauer join us and also we'll have a rep from CDD Ghana also to speak to us. Now, let's start off our story with a report that was put out yesterday uh, by uh, the CDD and it's the latest Afrobarometer survey on economy, public services and taxation. Now, it's revealed that majority of Ghanaians believe that the country is headed in the wrong direction. In fact, we're told that out of the total people sampled, about 87% of them thought that the country was headed in the wrong direction and only 11% percent of them actually thought that the country was headed in the right direction. Take a look at the story. The Afrobarometer Round 9 survey interviewed a nationally representative sample of 2,400 adult Ghanaians in April. Amongst the key findings, three-fourths of Ghanaians or seven out of every ten Ghanaians opposed the e-levy. A similar proportion believe it's a bad idea as it will increase the tax burden on the poor and ordinary citizens. 51% are not at all confident and 24% are not very confident government will use the revenue for the intended purpose. Reacting to the findings, economist and professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Godfrey Bokpin, reiterated calls for the e-levy to be scrapped, insisting it is a lazy approach to generate revenue. We should just know that from day one, it was poorly conceived, and this is not a tax handle you introduce at this time. It doesn't meet the basic principles of taxation in economics. So it's very difficult to situate the tax both at the policy level and implementation. It's not only at the policy level, even implementation, you're going to have a lot of what challenges and all of that. So it, it, it's a no-go area. And I still, still, I still think that government needs to withdraw it. The state, in its case to raise more money, should not become an arm robber. He also expressed worry over the seeming waste in the system, calling for a relook at the tax exemptions regime. When it comes to the ordinary Ghanaian, we are exempting them 100 Ghana cities a day, right? But we are willing to exempt multinationals that are in tax-paying position, billions of dollars. The studies, and this is not just theoretical, empirical data suggests that we are losing between 3 to 5% of GDP annually to exemptions alone. If you do the calculation and you use GDP of 2019, Ghana was losing in excess of 20 5 billion cities. 
On the economy, the survey showed 87% of Ghanaians believe the country is moving in the wrong direction. This, Professor Bokbin said, it is a true reflection of the situation on the ground, adding if the survey were conducted after the decision to go to the IMF, the responses would have been worse. Let's move away from broad policies. Let's begin to look at specific policies that would address the key issues in our economy. There's nothing national about the national cake. What is national about the national cake is that when you are present, when it's being shared, and it's not every Ghanaian that is at the table. Director of Research at the Afrobarometer, Dr. Adam Salome, noted the sample size yields country-level results. And that's a report on the Afrobarometer survey. Let me just welcome quickly my second guest in the studio, lawyer Joyce Bar Mukhtari. She's a special aide to former President John Dramani Mahama and also former Deputy uh, Transport Minister. Good morning, lawyer. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, and good morning to good you. Good morning. Everybody. Good to see you in the studios. Now, let's cross over quickly to the phone lines and speak to Mavis Zubok uh, Dom. She's the Afrobarometer Ghana National Investigator for CDD Ghana. Good morning, Mavis. Hello, Mavis. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining everybody. us. I hope you're well. I am well, and you? I'm good. Thank you very much. And, uh, of course, this conversation is on the back of the report from the survey that was conducted um, recently and was put out. Now, first of all, I want to understand how many people were sampled in total? Right. We sampled 2,400. Okay. Which yields the margin um, of error of plus or minus two. Okay. 2,400 people. And out of these 2,400 yes. people, what were some of the questions that you asked them? So, after we asked a broad range of uh, policy questions um, that include governance, democracy, um, the economy, um, taxation, uh, public services, uh, elections, gender, and other issues. So there are a really broad range of issues. And yesterday, what we released was on the economy, public services, and taxation. Okay. Economy, public service, and taxation. Yes. On the back of the economy, I mean, clearly, there was a question about which direction the country was headed. And the report yes. says that about 87% of these 2,400 people that were sampled said it was headed in the bad direction? Yes. Yes. Um, it said that it was headed in the wrong direction. Mm. Okay. And if you can expatiate more on that, because we want some more details on that. So 87% of them said we're headed in the wrong direction. Now, if you look yes. at the survey that was conducted back in 2019, um, of course, this one currently says that only 11% said that we're headed in the right direction. But as of 2019, just about, what, 35% of them um, said that we're headed in the right direction. So that means that there's right. been a drop in the yes, number so of people when, yes so when you look at the trend of um when we started asking this question started asking this question way back um as far as um the first afro survey okay but when we look we looked at the trend in the past 10 years and if you look at the trend since 2017 it has actually been dropping mm. so 2017 it um 50 percent said it was going in the right direction mm -hmm. then it dropped to 35 um, in 2019, and now it is just 11%. That's basically one in 10 saying the country is going in the right direction. That's a sharp drop just mm. within two, two years. And you, if you look at the other questions that were related, uh, asked related to the economy, then it explains a lot of the reasons um, you, would, you would see such a, a response around the uh, um, what were the reasons? Yeah, what were the reasons being attributed to why they thought the country was either headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? Right. So when we do not ask, um, it's a public opinion survey. So we do not ask the why questions. Mm. We do not ask open-ended questions. Okay. But there are a lot of questions that we ask. That when you look back at respondents' uh, response to those questions then it will tell you um, why they say that, right? Mm. So when you look at um, they saying, uh, talking about whether um, they have gone without food or, or water or income, you, you see that uh, 
poverty level are rising. What we use to measure our lived poverty, I think people haven't experienced poverty. We ask questions around have you gone without food, water, cash income, medical care. Mm. And if you aggregate that and look at, okay, who are those who have gone without any, that is those who have lived, uh, not experienced poverty, and compared to those who have experienced poverty, then one, those who say they have experienced um, poverty have actually increased um, mm. over time. Right, between uh, 2017 and now, those who say they have experienced poverty have increased. Mm. Those who say that their living conditions are better uh, or have also dropped, their own living conditions have also dropped uh, from uh, 37% into 2019, 20%. Okay. So they see their, their living conditions as dropping. Those who say that uh, the, the country's economic conditions are, are good or, or very good have also dropped. You mm. have also dropped sharply to just 11 percent, saying that the economy is good, right? So if you look at those who also say that, oh, uh, if you if you if you compare the country in the um, last 12 months, how do you see the economic conditions? They will mm. tell you that the economic conditions were worse. They said the economic conditions were worse than seven in ten. But those who, um, when we ask, what about the next um, 12 months? Mm. As, as high as five in ten say that uh, they don't, they are not optimistic about the next twelve months being better. Mm. And and when you look at they assessing government uh, performance on some issues, uh, it has also dropped managing the economy, creating jobs, improving standards of living, narrowing gaps, the uh, income gaps, mm. and keeping prices down have also dropped. The, the, the positive assessment of government around those issues has also dropped. Okay. And for the for the first time, the management. When you ask the question of um, what is the most important issue you want the government to address, mm -hmm. right? We ask you first. You mentioned first, then we ask you second, then we ask you third. Okay. Those who, uh, the first response, management of the economy came top. For the okay. second response, again, management of the economy and unemployment came top again. Then followed by infrastructure and roads. So mm. when you put all these together you would understand why people are saying that the country is going mm. um, in the wrong direction. Now, let's quickly touch on E-Levy before we wrap up on this conversation with you, Mavis. So right. it also said that about 74% of the persons that were sampled said they disapproved of the E-Levy. Yeah. That's quite high. Very high. Uh, very, very high. And interestingly, um, as high as uh, 67 Totally disapproved, they strongly disapproved. So when you put the disapproval together, mm. then you have that. But when you even split them to see who are those who somewhat disapprove and they strongly disapprove, you see 67 saying that they strongly disapprove it. Mm. And um, they say it's a bad idea and it's a tax burden. They disapprove it because they feel it's a tax burden. That is the reason why they, they, they are disapproving, it's a tax burden. Wow. And, and and people are split between whether they would want to continue using it or not. But most importantly, all this is around, you can put this around the back of the issue of people not being confident mm. in what uh, government will use the money um, for. Because government will use the money for development, but people are not confident that government will use the money for development. Mm. Every one in two persons said they are not confident in government. So, all right. Um, it's a bit telling, and it, it doesn't really matter the party line, even with people who are NPP supporters, as high as uh, 6% disapproved in uh, um, levy. So okay. it's, a, it's a huge disapproval, of course. All right. Thank you so much, Mavis, for speaking to us this morning. Mavis Supok Dom yes. is the Afrobarometer Ghana National Investigator for CDD Ghana. Let me start off with you, lawyer. And, well, this is the latest survey. Damien? Well, terribly, terribly damning. Terribly disappointing. And sadly tells us very simply that government has completely failed. It also is testament to the abysmal performance of this government. It is time for government to actually take a very, very close look at itself, how it has carried and conducted itself over the years since they were elected in office, 
how they have very quickly literally swallowed up completely all the goodwill that heralded this administration into office. Indeed, it is also very, very important that we also note that we did not actually have to wait for the Afrobarometer report per se, that most of the indicators that the lady spoke about in terms of the economy, in terms of our conditions of living, in terms of social things, largely, most, if not all Ghanaians, are added them that government has literally dug a huge hole and sunk each and every citizen in terms of how much we have borrowed till date. And you do know that the debate has been about the current unsustainable levels of Ghana's debt situation. And I mean, these are matters of public record. I don't think that we need to belabor those points. Secondly, we also appreciate the fact that we need at least close to 50 billion Ghana cities to service our current debts. It is also not in doubt that for all the euro bond proceeds that we received, mm -hmm. nobody knows what has happened. At least what we do know is that the uh, finance minister admitted that his personal companies, private company, had made at least 159 million Ghana cities from uh, services as transaction advisors. We also know that the other deputy, formerly of the finance ministry now, of the presidency has a company also engaged in similar businesses. How much they have received this far, we do not know. You know, in terms of hardship, nobody actually defines hardship for any citizen or any individual for that matter. For as long as transportation fares increase, for as long as cost of petroleum and petroleum products goes up, it affects every key facet or component of this economy. And so when you talk about markets, you talk about purchasing, you talk about high cost of living, you talk about difficult conditions of uh, persons living under the poverty levels, you do know then that there is a need for each and every one to literally do a very close, close introspection. Ask how we arrived where we are. You know, the center is certainly not holding, and I have no mm -hmm. doubt in my mind that in the past, by this time, you would have seen the many responses that would have come, both formally and otherwise, to the Afrobarometer reports and many others. Indeed, we also know for a fact that this week the uh, IMF is in town, and uh, we are told that Ghana's deficit is currently at the highest mm. in the last how many years? And that advice has been given for government to quickly do the needful, first, cut down totally on expenditure, secondly, introduce some austerity measures. Indeed, at a time when uh, we're introducing the electronic uh, levy, what all the persons who went in and around the country on that roadshow told all of us was that, we either pay the e-levy or we go to the IMF. Indeed, as we all well know, even prior to the rumpus that greeted this particular issue on the floor of parliament, many Ghanaians had literally rejected any notion of paying that particular levy. Indeed, there were demonstrations sometimes. We also had many of your platforms actually carry out your own research by sampling the views of Ghanaians on various social media platforms. And I do know that this obnoxious e-levy was totally rejected, resoundingly. We certainly did not need further validation from the uh, Afrobarometer. It is a matter of public record as well. But if, if we had the finance minister travel the country, at least some five regions were visited, uh, just to sensitize Ghanaians on the e-levy and why we needed it. And he assured Ghanaians that we are going to use it for the purposes that it's intended um, for. And so go ahead and pay. And yet Ghanaians rejected that. Was that assurance not enough to at least encourage Ghanaians that, yes, you are asking for jobs, you are asking for roads to be fixed. And we're showing you the way by which we can address some of these challenges. If you pay some more tax, then maybe we can fix these problems. Why would then would they still continue to reject it? You know, unfortunately, all of us are literally very, very discerning. We can see what is going on.
we, we can we can hear you because we, we, of we the, can yeah. see what is going on we understand and appreciate what exactly is going on look over the last few months i'd say this government has received one billion u.s dollars a facility from the imf mm. they received 200 million u.s dollars from the stabilization fund established by their predecessor administration 430 million u.s dollars from the world bank 400 million out of the 1 billion US dollar special drawing rights provided to the Bank of Ghana. Over 100 million from the African Development Bank and its bilateral partners. 20 billion Ghana cities from the Bank of Ghana. Put all of this together and we are still borrowed almost to the hilt. At current inflation rates, and I heard this morning mm. a finance expert who said that the budget had actually envisaged $60 as the base rate. Mm. But prices had doubled up at least twice and thrown the whole budget off. Mm. And so they had no options really but to reschedule the presentation of the mid-year review Thank budget. You, yeah. you know. So certainly nothing is holding. You know, look, if you look at the levels of corruption that has gone on, if you look at the Auditor General's report, for example, if you look at the Public Procurement Authority, single source projects, and some of the names of those companies, mostly without a track record. If you cross-check on the levels of benefits to cronies and aficionados of government, and of course, appointees of government themselves, look at the character and size of government alone presently. And beyond all of that is also the unnecessary expenditure on jet trips, on private trips, on hotels, on large government delegations. They said it's on about huge... the security of the president, oh, which is why they had to make some of these decisions. Let me tell you, and I don't say this and don't consider it lightly, there are many jets out there, Bella, all shapes and sizes. Even at my level, even at my level, mm. I am very, very certain that I can probably go out there and even negotiate for one at a lot less. 34 million is a lot of money to throw on private travel, irrespective. And you know, when you say these things, you find government and its uh, communicators immediately retort that uh, there are benefits. So where are all the benefits, Bella? How have we spent the benefits? Of course, Ghanaians are very mistrustful. Why would they believe anybody who says anything? Did we not get vaccines the, at the time when the oh. president traveled to go and see the then German chancellor? You know... Is that not one of the benefits that remember, we got from remember, the president's Remember trips? at the time, the AU itself had started some conversations about receiving vaccines especially for Africa. Note that in Europe in particular, some level of vaccine nationalism was actually developing. Mm. So there was then a need, it had become almost like a human rights concern. So there was a need, for example, to ensure that there was a fair and equitable distribution. In any case, most of the vaccines we received came at no cost really to the Ghanaian taxpayer. And you remember the pump and pageantry that greeted even the arrival of the first uh, batch of vaccines. Mm. Look, you know, I would want to say one thing that government has largely not been as transparent, not also been as accountable, and has literally failed on every promise that they made. I mean, look at the energy sector levy, for example. And I had listened this morning mm. to another expert mm. who said that this was the time to return yeah. to that energy sector level, to make it pay for what it was set up for. But you and I know that 50% of that levy has actually been collateralized. Same for the GET fund. So immediately those monies go into that fund. What happens to it? It's gone. Look, we ought to start to call government out. For example, on one, the size of government. Two, on the levels. Look at the amounts of monies paid out to an architectural firm set up to come in and construct the cathedral well over 200 million sole sourced 
We are told in the beginning that it was going to cost 100 million to construct that facility. Then we're told it was going to be 150 million. And then we're told it was going to be 300 million. And now we are told it would cost in the regions of what? 400 million. We also know about our standing compensation to persons who had properties in that catchment area. You know, there are just so many issues that you don't even know where to start from and where to end. And when you judge by the challenges even of most, if not all, the anti-corruption agencies and governments, look, when was the last time you heard the president speak about using their mass principle to fight corruption, for example? When was the last time you heard any government appointee speak about the levels of corruption and the need to do something about it? When was the last time you heard any person in government refer any matters for investigation or otherwise to any agency? We're here when we're informed that the dismissed boss of the Public Procurement Authority, one of the anti-corruption uh, agencies, mm -hmm. that indeed even f funds that had been frozen had actually been siphoned out of his personal accounts. Mm -hmm. Wherein lies the accountability or the need for sale? There's been a call for an investigation into COVID funds and how they were expended. We're still waiting. The, the finance minister came out and gave us an account oh. of the COVID funds. Even at the end of that presentation, there were disparities in his presentation as against that of His Excellency the President. Then Gov 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 Parliament itself decided that there should be a certain committee mm. established to investigate and vet the figures that were presented. Mm. We're still waiting. You know, it is actually very, very important to state for the record that if you look at the sorts of receipts from COVID, if you look at the oil reserves, when we left office, only one oil field was on stream. Mm. The 10 facilities came on stream when we left. Indeed, Ghana's economy was posited by all research financial institutions to grow by 8% in 2017. We are also now told that this government actually requested, after extending the IMF program they inherited, mm. demanded that they wanted to exit. And as soon as they exited that program, what happened? Between 2018 and 2020. They went on this extreme spending spree, which is why we are where we are. And so it's not COVID, it's not um, yeah, Russia-Ukraine war like they always posit? We all heard the World Bank president speak in February of 2020, mm -hmm. that even before COVID struck, this economy was almost at the ICU. It is just that sadly it has been stripped totally bare. And when you listen to the figures, when you listen to conversations about money, that cannot be accounted for. What does that tell you? Okay. It is important that all of us as citizens call on government to start to account. They, they, you know, we can make all the excuses we want, but we all know that this government in particular campaigned on the background of what? Never returning to the IMF. Indeed, we are currently at the levels of 2003 mm. when the Kofu administration went into Epic for heavily indebted poor countries. So we have come a very long way. So if indeed by 2017, the economy was going to grow by at least 8%, where did that 8% go? When did it end? It certainly did not end or start with COVID or with the Ukraine war. You know, look, it is also instructive that we note that when you read the Auditor General's report, in terms of the waste, in terms of the borrowing, these are the undergirdings of why we are where we are. And today, to my utter shock and disappointment, and to an extent even sadness, the Vice President, as chairperson of the so-called solid team, is suddenly nowhere to be seen. We're expecting him to speak today. I am looking forward to him speaking and telling Ghanaians that all the money he saw while he served as a deputy governor disappeared under his watch in his belt. That the money that we were sitting on, that they sought 
to tell Ghanaians that some other president or executive was literally not spending on the good people of Ghana, was all given to them as custodians, and they have failed to account for sin. That for all the raft of excuses they give, there are just as many explanations for why we are where we are. Mm. And the stories lie in the corruption, they lie in the single-sourced projects, they lie in the inability even of anti-corruption structures to work, they lie in the refusal of government to come out in a transparent manner to account. Look, even on the floor of parliament, you watch the sheer arrogance. You watch the lack of candor even in some of the presentations. Remember that when the finance minister arrived before the house, there were 16 questions because for months he had been unable to present himself before the august house mm. to respond to these questions. Look, let's okay. start simply by asking government. And please land on this for me if you can. As much as possible, take steps to implement the recommendations under the Auditor General's report, first and foremost. Okay. Secondly, to cut down, and I've heard many people across the board calling for a downsizing. First, of the numbers of ministers, mm. secondly, of the office of government machinery. Mm. And I have always believed also, look, all the ministries that were created, I think it is time for down. us to start to vet the I'd, impact, I'd want us to come back on the effect, okay. and just what Ghanaians have achieved. I'll let you hold on agencies. to this issue about ministerial appointments and the number of ministers we had because we've heard from the majority leader and he's speaking on it as well. But let's hear from Ama um, on the report, the CDD report, because if you look at 2017, at least 50% of Ghanaians thought that the country was headed in the right direction. How did we move from 50% of people looking at things in a positive light to just about 11% of them saying that as it stands now in 2022, the country is headed in the right direction. What did your government do wrong? Um, I won't say the government did something wrong um, in general. Okay. Because after 2017, 2018, 2019, um, reports said that um, Ghana was the fastest growing economy in the world. Mm. So we were definitely on the right track. We were definitely doing something right. Um, first and foremost, the Afrobarometer report. I've not read all of it okay. in depth, but I've seen um, slides and some of the um, um, uh, comments that have come after it, after sampling 2,400 um, Ghanaians. Mm. And they all, or majority of them, said almost the same thing. Um, government has never stood anywhere and said that they don't care. Um, the last time I came here, I think the day before, sector ministers, certain sector ministers were meeting captains of industry, um, mm. heads of um, our traditional markets, um, you know, people that run the economy. They had met them, um, transport union leaders and all that, to talk about the effects um, of everything that's going wrong around, around us, globally, locally, you know, in Ghana as well. Mm. So it's not like government has denied or, you know, um, said they're not doing anything about it. But Ghanaians say that government officials are very arrogant in even addressing the concerns that they put forward. And for them, that is even a problem. Um, I, I don't know um, what arrogance means in this term, but sometimes when you stand your ground, you say what you have to say, or you look at what you have on the table, and it's not at par with what somebody else is thinking. They assume that you are showing arrogance. So if I come here and I say something that, or Joy say something and I don't agree with it, it doesn't mean that I'm being arrogant. I do not agree with what she's saying because of A, B, C, and D. It has nothing to do with it. Maybe, um, some, for lack of a better word, when you are able to confidently express yourself, somebody might misconstrue that as arrogance. Be that as me, that is Ghanaians. We are here to serve them. We, 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 we are their um, 
we go to the polls, we assure them that we are going to do a, an even better job than what our previous or our predecessors have done, and they expect more from us. Mm. So I don't take that away from um, any electorate or any Ghanaian who believes or who thinks that some appointees or some government um, uh, ministers or anyone is arrogant. Maybe it's their way of communicating. You might not understand it or they might look standoffish to you. Mm -hmm. But um, I wouldn't go out there and say that everyone or all um, appointees, everyone is different. Mm -hmm. How I say it and how it comes across to you might be different from what other persons might say. Okay. So let's, uh, uh, on that score, I would... I would um, yeah, let me just come in briefly and I'll allow you to talk. So now you talk about the fact that no government official has stood anywhere openly and said that they don't care about the plight of Ghanaians. But constantly, if Ghanaians have been asking for you to account for the president's travels, and we have the defense minister, we have the national security minister, and we have all of them coming to explain why the president needs to charter these private jets, and this is a national security matter. Ghanaians are saying that you're telling us there's no money, and yet every time we complain, we hear of another instance where the president has had another private jet and is traveling around the world and is costing the taxpayer tons of money. Um, Do you really care about the regular Ghanaian on the streets who's struggling to even make ends meet when the president is flying, you know, these luxury jets and government um, is paying so much money for it? Do you care? Um, I wouldn't. I have never been in a private jet, so I can't um, speak on luxurious or not. But before the president travels out of the country, every time he travels, he sends a memo to parliament. He tells parliament where he's going to. And then if you look on the websites of Jubilee House or um, Eugenia Hinn's page, they always come out to tell us where the president is traveling to. I have not seen any of these memos that come out that have said that the president is going on vacation, he's going jet skiing, or he's mm. going anywhere. It's always for work. Mm. It is always, always for work. The president is traveling for a conference here. He's going, sometimes there are three stops. He's going two days here. He's mm. going another day here. And all these are for work. Meetings, um, um, conferences and all that. None of them have come out to say that the president is hopping on a private jet from A to B. Mm. For me, secondly, whether it's President A, B, C or D, I do not believe that we should compromise their security. For me, that yeah, is what I also believe. also don't go for the most luxurious. So the ACJ Neo like this, when you look at the fleet of jets that that company has, we're told that that is their most luxurious jet. And that is the one that the president decided to fly in at one point in time. We're told that it cost us about some 15,000 um, US dollars an hour. We asked for governments to account for that, and they said they cannot because it's a national security matter. I am not a security expert. Do you not leave room for conjecture when you refuse to account to Ghanaians when they've gone on the website and realized that what the president is said to have hired was the most luxurious part um, of the fleet of jets? When you go onto a website, any website at all, and you pick figures from there, and you do not know the details, for parliament, for ministry of defense, for ministry of national security, at that time, at that present time, they believed that this was the one that was um, okay for the president to use. I do not have that um, expertise to come and sit here and say, oh, it cost too much or it didn't cost too much. For every time that the president travels, for me and for some Ghanaians or for um, uh, certain Ghanaians, they believe that he did not go out there to play. If he traveled on a jet. It was what was available, what the security experts at that time believed was right for him to travel on. I do not, I cannot come and sit here. Yes, I understand that times are hard and people are complaining. But in that same vein, do we compromise the security of the president? Touch wood, if anything goes wrong, it is us same Ghanaians who would come out and say that, oh, why did you allow Mr. President to go on this particular aircraft? Why couldn't you have gotten a better one? Most times, sitting back and talking about what is happening there is easier, like mm. you said, conjecture. But when it comes to the actuals, when um, Parliament invited the Minister for Defence, who is a member of Parliament, he went there, he went to speak to them, and he explained why, at this particular moment, he could not divulge certain information. It is not every information that comes to us. And sometimes it's on a need-to-know basis. Even the, the people that 
travel with the president or the people that work within that same area. Mm -hmm. There are different categories of information that goes to person A or person B. Mm. It does not mean that because you assume or because you've seen a figure, it means that, oh, the president is just being um, wasteful or government machinery is just wasting money on the president's mm. travels or anything. I believe that we should have faith in the people that we have elected, the people that are serving us. If we start compromising the security of the president, the vice president, the, the, the top hierarchy, we are not safe. What about his wife then? Are we compromising the security of his wife if she's flying the Falcon to Rwanda for an event? And we're told that the president um, could not uh, come to Ghana the to fly. So the he president to was not jet. in Ghana at that time. Let's, let's not confuse these matters. Mm. The president was not in Ghana. The president did not travel with his wife to all the other European countries that he went to. If Madame Antibeki had gone with the president and then she had come back to Ghana with him and then the president had insisted that no, you fly on the Falcon and I'm coming on a private jet, that is a different no, matter altogether. The reason why the president cannot fly the Falcon is because security wise it's not the best yes but then not in safe. this particular but instance yet, that yet you are saying flew it. she flew it from ghana to rwanda so we don't care about her security no at that time the security experts believe that it was safe or believe that from ghana to rwanda they can make the trip i'm not an aviation expert so okay. i cannot make those decisions he could not and have flown that to paris because we're told that of course at that time when he had to go um to belgium as well there was a strike and so they could not use the, the, there was uh, a strike they couldn't use they had exactly, to get a but flight he had to fly to paris yes which um, is how many hours to paris i do not know Just because about i don't what, six hours i don't travel so. on these things but so i for me could that flight, Bella, could that me, i'm not, I'm not to about paris, to defend was the train or, to Brussels um, comes back, uses that falcon, comes for the wife, and so goes you, you, to Rwanda. You, you think, don't that, think that? And even that would even have been right? at that, even at that, I think or I believe that security aspects do not advise that certain um, um, persons travel together. I, 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 that much I think I know that okay. you do not put all of them on a flight. So at certain times, you do not. If the president and the vice president or some members of family are even going to the same destination, mm. it is not advised that they all go on the same flight. So if the first lady traveled from Ghana to Rwanda and the president joined her. Mm. from another destination and they both went in different aircraft it does not mean that we are being wasteful if on the same if on the other hand the president had flown from um brussels to ghana and then joined from ghana to rwanda you'd have people who'd have asked why couldn't he have gone straight there instead of coming back and joining all these things are matters that for me are matters of national security i do not want to know um, why there was a, a, a break in this or a chain here you and there. You don't want to know? I want, to, I want to be assured that the president, the first lady, are safe. For me, bottom line. What about your children? If you're a teacher and you're asking for cola, are you going to be concerned about... No, I'm no, 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 I'm bringing that in because you're okay, saying so that, me, of course, we have to be go, concerned about the president's safety. Yes, but I'm then worried, that I'm regular teacher who cannot afford transportation to work, Bella. The economy is in shambles. They have to pay more for everything. You think at that point they are thinking more about the president's safety, which is why he should fly so, so a luxurious private we might, jet we over might the money well, that they would have to we use might to as feed well their family. To an agreement to that we might as well come to an agreement that um, Ghanaians do not want Mr. President to travel out for any business at all and stay here to ensure that things go on. All these things are part of the reason why he's president. He will travel at but some. But he's not point. expected to. He's not expected to. He can always delegate someone to go in his stead. So, okay. So, so if there's no if law that says a, that it's if the president that a, always a, has to travel. A, a meeting of heads of state, you believe that because uh, um, Ghanaians are facing, or we are all going through these things, Mr. President shouldn't go. He should de delegate the Minister for Foreign Affairs. They are, they are all, that's why I mentioned that there are levels of meetings. There are, there are so many of them that the president does not attend, even though he's the one invited. But there are some of them too that you cannot delegate. Mm. You have to be there. You are expected to be there. What then happens? Are he we says, going tighten your belt? We are tightening our belt. We are all tightening our belt. It does, that does not mean that Mr. President mm -hmm. or the Office of Government should come to a standstill. It is all part of these things. These things are all part of governance. Mm. And for me, if there's an um, a conference, um, a, a, a travel that the president has to go. I believe he has to. There are benefits that come from it. Not all benefits are uh, manifest physical. There are treaties that are signed. There are agreements that are made and all that. 
round table discussion, sometimes you need to be there. During COVID, no one traveled. There were Zoom meetings that were happening. Heads of states were having, having Zoom meetings. The president was having ECOWAS meetings on Zoom mm. and all that. But afterwards and then when the world opened, he is traveling out there. He understands the situation we are in. Let's not also make it that the president is insensitive to the plight of Ghanaians. Only last week, I think when he was um, um, giving um, roles to ambassadors and high commissioners, mm. he appealed to teachers, using that as an opportunity, to appeal to teachers to please go back to their classroom. Let's union leaders and labor would you, would you have gone back? He appealed. I Hold said he appealed. This is still the big issue on TV3 New Day. This segment is proudly brought to you by Niche Chocolate and Niche Cocoa Drink. And they have options for you. So whether it's a 250 ml bottle or the 180 ml Tetra packs, you can enjoy it big or small, uh, whatever time of the day. And of course, it is packed with all the vitamins and minerals that you require. So whenever you're thinking of what to drink, remember, it's Niche Chocolate Drink. Niche Taste of Ghana. In the studios, I have Hajia Ama Frimpong, and she speaks for the NPP. She's a member of the communications team for the NPP, and lawyer Joyce Ba Mukhtari, of course, here representing the NDC, and she's a special aide to former President John Dramani Mahama. Hajia, I'm coming back to you because we're just talking about COLA being requested by the teachers, and of course, the president did appeal to the teachers to go back. And I was asking you that if you were a teacher at this very harsh economic time, if the president says go back to the classroom, while we negotiate, would you do that? Um, I'll take that in good faith. Believe that my leaders who are negotiating on our behalf would do a good job, mm. first and foremost. If it wasn't, um, he appealed to them, please go and let the negotiations take place. In saying that, it hasn't been just the teachers who, have, um, um, who are on strike. There are other ones, mm -hmm. and then the healthcare um, professionals is, yeah. are also um, talking about it as well. I believe the government, the president, everyone understands and knows the harsh economic situation we are in now. And the unions are also very right in demanding for COLA for their, um, the people they represent. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's more about dialogue. They are asking for 20% COLA. Yeah. Um, they are going to go to the table, sit. I had um, one of the teacher union leaders saying that just because we've said 20% does not mean that we mm. are expecting all the 20%. If we get all that, hey, hallelujah. But then there has to be, the government has to meet at halfway, yeah. which is what the president appealed. Please go back to work and let them do the negotiations. I, be, I think there's been two... Um, Meeting so Three, far. Actually. That Yesterday a, there was another oh, one okay, I heard about that the, happened. The previous ones and mm. they came out to say that um, there was no firm agreement. Same for yesterday too. Oh, it I was inconclusive in, yesterday. In, yeah, oh, inconclusiveness. Mm. But that means that there's there's talking happening. Inconclusive does not mean that we are we are standing where we are. It means we haven't come to an agreement yet. We still we are still um, not happy with what they are offering. We are still asking. They haven't even offered, and that's the thing. So the teachers are saying yesterday when they went to the meeting that government did not come with an offer. The, 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 They're um, just saying that the call has, off your strike before we can negotiate. The government has not come out to say what has happened at the meeting yet. We've heard the, teach, um, the unions telling their, their members the, what they, they has happened there. Mm. Let's wait for them to... If it, even the government if it's has ten, spoken. Ten so times. the deputy employment, employment minister, minister says yes. we cannot negotiate with the teachers if they are on strike. Unless they call up the strike as per the Labour Act, we cannot go ahead and negotiate. Um, and so are, they have not been able to put forward we, any we are, we are at, proposal we are at, at all point until where the strike at, is They are on off. strike now. Mm. For me, we are at that point where they are on strike now. There's not, there, has, they don't, there doesn't have to be a, a firm stance that it's either my way or no way. That's what I believe. There has to be a middle ground. I'm sure everyone that sits at the table knows... Um, before I'm misquoted, so I won't even use that word, but mm. they all understand what their roles are. That you don't have to come to that um, firm stance that I'm not listening to you if you don't do this. Right now, where we are, we don't need that kind of um, um, agitation. Mm. The, the, the system is already agitated as it is. Teachers play a, cru a crucial role. The kids are going to be writing exams very soon. Yeah. That's one of the things that we have to also consider.
for two days to come to an agreement to ensure that we move on and take into agreement that there are other unions who are also knocking on the door mm. and it's for the same color. So kindly come to an agreement here where it binds or it's binding on everyone for whatever they are asking so that we move forward. We are already at that stage. There's no point in going to sit down, come out, going to sit down. Of course, people are angry. Sometimes there may be raised voices here and there. But at the end of the day, it's what's best for everyone's interest. They also have to take into consideration that government is also not in a good place to meet every single demand of theirs. Mm. That's also another angle that they have to understand. So that they all come together, meet halfway, and decide what's best and what works for both Why sides. Why governments have to wait to this point um, of them declaring a strike and threatening to go on a strike? I mean, two days ago, we had Dr. Titus Bayou here. He's the General Secretary for the Ghana Medical Association. And he said that about six letters had been written to the Finance Ministry for a, a separate demand from the Ghana Medical Association. That was supposed to have been a meeting that they were supposed to have. The ministry never responded to them until they wrote another letter threatening a strike in August. That is when the Finance Ministry hurriedly came in and asked if they could negotiate and start talking about what it is they were demanding. And it's the same thing that these other organized labor unions are also saying that we gave government till the end of June to address this COLA system and situation. They never heeded to our calls until we decided to embark on a so, strike. Um, and now government is so coming right in and saying, I'm going to strike. cry over spilled milk. We've gone past that stage. For me, mm -hmm. we've gone past it. Government did not heed to their cries when they were knocking at the door. They've broken into the room now. What's the way forward? That's what we are looking yeah, at. Yeah, but you don't wait for me to go on strike before you I, tell me I have to call off my strike so you can um, address my but, problem. Uh, okay, you so have I'm so not an, many weeks So they've had the opportunity. To address the they problem. had weeks, but it wasn't addressed then. It's being addressed now. It might not be the best, or it might not have been the best option to take or to wait for it to get to this stage. But we are there now. What's the way forward? For me, as a parent, I'm worried about the kids too. So please, we are appealing to them. I'm appealing to them. I know it's easier said than done. Times are hard. They need this to cushion themselves. And I know that at the end of the day, governments would definitely come to agreement with the leaders and all other um, factions involved so that we all move forward. They would not renegade, renege on their duties mm. here, or we would not renege on our duties here. What is the way forward? Are we still going to go back and forth, A said this, B didn't mind me, and then hope that in the next instances, it would not get to this stage where another strike has to come on, because this is not the first time. Mm. We've had series of strikes going on and on, and everyone is privy to the information out there. But for me, right now, at this stage where we are, with all the economic situations that we find ourselves in, let's find an amicable solution to the problem, work out what's best for both sides, and then teachers go back to the classroom. The health professionals do not have to go on a strike here. Last night on another station, I heard someone mention that it will start with wearing red armbands yes, and then escalate onto that. Yes. Please, we do not want any escalations of that. These are the pivots of society. These are the people that hold society. Health is wealth. Not all of us can afford to go private. How many of, how many of us afford to go private anyway? Mm. So, and then teachers, they are the backbone. So please... If they are, this is where, where we are now, let's move forward. Let's find a lasting solution to it, and then everyone gets what they deserve. How much further is government willing to go to tighten its belt um, so that we can also manage the economic crisis that we face at the moment? I know that the president during the Eid celebrations announced that, of course, uh, the president and the executive cut are cutting 30, their cut salary 30%. by 30%. Now, these labor unions are saying that 30% really doesn't make any difference. It's a, a drop in the ocean when you look at how much even teachers are asking for and the concerns that they have. Because if someone in the executive is probably, let's just say, is earning about 15000 someone at the presidency is earning 15000 I think that we're cutting I don't, that by. I don't think someone... No, I'm just saying at the presidency, for example, is so earning about 15000 So the president 15, earns 15000 But I'm not sure someone at the presidency who is... Nobody um, in the presidency I'm not earns 15000 I, I don't know somebody's salary. But I'm saying, like, let's say the president earns 20000 Let's say okay. that. How much? How much? Now, 30% okay. of that, really, it doesn't make much of a Bella, difference. Bella, the, um, so the you are not necessarily tightening your belt like you're asking that, us to? The situation has always been that people mm. expect that the, the salary um, par disparity is narrowed. Mm. That's, that's the general idea, or that's what we all expect mm. to happen. Unfortunately, right now, if you say that let's cut... Um, 
all appointees' salaries to from 30 percent mm. to 70 percent let's slash it to 70 percent you will still have people mm. who would say that it is not enough mm. definitely you're still going to have someone who is going to say that even with the 70 percent it's not enough one other thing is also that um we need to find a lasting solution to the salary disparity for me that's the crux of the matter are you even willing to address it because um, if the Monuments Committee increases the salaries of Article 71 office holders by, let's say, even more than 60%. The, and they yet, haven't done that. Yet. And let's also... They haven't let, done that? No, they haven't. What is the they percentage haven't done of that. increase for no, um, they, the I don't think it, it went even up to... Because last week, I saw... I, I Probably when Joyce is speaking, I'm going to take that one out and read it for all of us to um, know. Because there's nowhere in that committee that mentioned that they should... I'll increase, let you pull it up then. Increase you it take up. your time I, and look for it. Find let it. me come in because with Joyce, uh, lawyer, lawyer Bam. Sometimes the misinformation out there also angers people more. Go ahead and look for that information and we'll come back to that conversation. But, lawyer, so, I mean, the issue about tightening belts, the president has said that we have cut down our salary by some 30%. Is that not enough to at least cushion us in the meantime or show us that government is willing to go the extra mile just to show that they're trying to save some money? Bella, thank you very much. What is unacceptable is the recklessness, is the insensitivity, mm. is actually the bad faith. And for me personally, is the useless, boring that has gone on. What we want to ask is that first, let's call on government to return most of the looted monies. Let's call on government to look at the Auditor General's report. Financial irregularities alone between 2017 and now were in the regions of 50 billion. Mm. That's a humongous amount of money. The president spent 15,000 pounds sterling on one trip alone. I think that is unconscionable. The next thing we also know is that in one of those trips, in total, and this was a conservative estimate, and let's put on record, government has not at any given time been able to first disagree with any of these figures, been able to tell us categorically whether they were higher or lower, mm. or even been able to tell us why. Look, the last jet had three washrooms. Tragic. The one that he flew from Brussels to Rwanda? Wherever, absolutely. Let me state that we ought to appreciate that in times past, government literally used teacher unions, nursing training institutions, teacher training institutions, most of this category of stakeholders, mm -hmm. literally as baits for all of the campaigns that they carried or undertook. How do you say that? Well, remember that there was a conversation leading up to the Senchi Accord in particular mm -hmm. in 2015, mm -hmm. where the NDC led by President Mahama had arrived at a position that because teachers were being fed on the various campuses. And at the time when they introduced all these uh, soft avenues for teachers to go to training colleges, they needed to actually build on the ratios and parity between teacher and child. But that now all those things were no longer uh, necessary because we had reached a certain level. Take, for example, the numbers of nurses who are leaving. I'm told in recent times, almost 3,000 nurses have left over the last few weeks to other jurisdictions where they are better paid. Indeed, I visited a hospital in the UK where there were more Ghanaian nurses on duty than any other category of person from any other origin. Mm. And look, when you speak about governments exhibiting good faith, then it means then that government itself has led by example, has actually taken responsibility for its own inactions and the inertia. Mm. Look, this inept government, the ineptitude that has currently permeated all facets of our economy, it is actually because of recklessness, because of pledges they never intended to keep, mm. because of promises they knew they were going to break. Look, so if we're talking about negotiations, why did our Minister for Finance not negotiate better for transaction advisory services? Why did they not do that? How can you admit to the country 
that your own company earned 159 million Ghana cities. It's unconscionable. Mm. I don't expect any leader ever in the history of this country to do so. And then all you have to show for your record in office is to take us back to the IMF. A subject matter you condemned, you criticized. Look, you know, Bella, it breaks my heart when I think about some of the things that have gone on. The impudence and the luxury with which our leaders live. Look at the irregularities and how much they cost us. The flying around and how much they cost us. Have you seen the types of dishes being served to our children in the schools as school feeding? And yet all this while our minister is what? Is away without any excuse. And we cannot even nominate a substantive minister but to we the have social a, minister, a minister, minister that's acting in her stead. The sanitation, the sanitation, minister sanitation is doubling itself as, is a huge as gender minister. And for how long will you double up? Look, I look forward to us legislating, for example, on some of these matters. For example, not wasting our resources on needless travel, not looting our monies in the name of being a transaction advisor. When you serve as government's ombudsman, there is too many wrong things ethically going on. And we ought to set up and demand accountability from this administration. Look, for every promise they made, for every pledge, it is a reason why trust is at an all-time low. Ghanaians are not children. You can't mm. deceive us. They told us to be citizens. Even in that plagiarized speech, we should have realized that President Akufuado knew very well that for most of the promises he made, they were going to be unable to deliver. You remember the conversation about whether we could bring back lives or not and how I was berated on this platform. Today, what have we done to repair the damaged economy? Hold on, please. So, Let her land. You know, I, 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 I think to my mind that government certainly ought to be doing more. Government ought to be more responsible. Stop the useless borrowing. Stop the noise making and the insults. Stop the arrogance. Above all, show good faith. Okay. You enter the social contract with the people who elected you into office. But have you noticed something interesting about this Afrobarometer report? That government literally has squandered its goodwill between 2017 and 2020. What happened to the same Ghanaians who sang all the praises that ushered or heralded President Akufado into office? You know, mm. look, I hope that we are learning lessons. Okay. Lessons in how not to behave because you want power. Lessons in how not to speak to matters you have no records of. Mm. Worst of all, when you elect people to be responsible and all they do is come into office and attain these reckless habits, that take us all mm. into a ditch. Okay. It's unfortunate, it's regrettable, and I expect a certain remorsefulness, a certain humility even. Look, if we have a chance to speak to some of these issues that we have all raised at length, mm. it is extremely important for us to remember that the same people who elected you into office will clearly send you back definitely into opposition and that that applies to every uh political party at all and so if you really do not deliver on your promises then you will not be given the chance uh to rule again unfortunately my time is up oh, even yeah. though i know you you i wanted to clear this one so please please i don't know if my producer, producer because they've already been counting me, me down for your, the your last five minutes me, so 30 concern. seconds what so does it say basically the yeah in tiamua Bedu presidential committee on emoluments recommended that percentage increases granted Article 71 office holders shall not exceed increases granted public sector workers on the single spine salary structure. And this is what the com committee's recommendations were. Quickly, For please. 2017, it was 10%, 2018, 10%, 2019, 10%, 2020, 10%, and 2021, none. So there's nowhere that it has been increased. There was no increment. None. I've just anyway. told you this one. All right. And then my Data time Bank. is up. We have In to go. In 2014, there were co Thank you so much, Hadia. When we went to IMF. So don't make we have it to seem go. like Thank you. Data Bank has only Thank you. So, so Hadia Ama Frimpong.